and welcome back to Dreadness, the mystic power philosophy and performance of shadow. And um, you have reached to the, the convoy section. Um, and so we're rounding out the day. And when I say rounding out the day, we're rounding out the talking part of the day because um, the finale is really the Dingole dance party. And like was stated earlier by Dr. Burke, if we're dealing with shadow, we had to deal with the dance part of it. Eh? We had to deal with the enjoyment. We, had, we have to round it off with music because he was a music man, yeah? But right now, uh, we are doing a convoi um, where we are going to be looking at uh, the topic is really we real dread. Everybody is somebody. And, you know, we are trying to look at Shadow's body of work, the dreadness as a way of life, really, a coping mechanism, you know, a form of, of joy, release, a means of resistance. And, and to help take us through that, we have some esteemed guests with us. Um, and and this, this is, I mean, today has by and large been a phenomenal experience. And I think with the kind of people that we have on this panel here, it could only continue in that line. Um, today we have with us Zeno Constance, uh, a playwright, author, teacher, artistic director of the Pfizer Bad Connection Theatre Company, lecturer, Calypso historian, um, and, and he, 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 he lectures at uh, the Calypso unit, uh, the Calypso course at UE, of course, and also he's an archivist, a collector. He's the person that, that I and most people will turn to anytime we're looking for a song at Calypso, um, and he'll be ready with it all the time. You know, Constance, yeah? Um, of course, we have also Robin Foster, um, another stalwart in his industry, um, responsible for, for the engine room, one of the founders of the engine room. Um, I think that was late, 80s into the 2000s and, and the engine room uh, was about sound but it was also a foundational space for artists um, where you would hear the stories from from the elders and the not so elders and the youth and, and everybody would mingle and, and if you pass through the engine room and through Robin Foster hands you're solid in the game you know Robin would have worked um, with TTT Video Associates by and large if you see it on TV and it's sounding good Robin, Robin, first time I have a demand behind it more, like, more than likely, yeah? Um, we also have Joanne Haynes, yeah? Joanne is an award-winning author and creative facilitator from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, the signature of all her work is that it is inspired by her Trinbegonian heritage while reaching to connect with a modern global world. Um, the former teacher and lecturer with a career spanning 10 years creating creative spaces for the learning and the development. Um, this is her passion. She has published three books, The Coral Tale, Walking, and The Sapote Tree. Um, her, her presentations in, in academia would include Myths and Legends, the UDT Journal, Seeing Ourselves Through the Eyes of Papa Nisa, Uriah Chacha Week, Sleep Tobago, Macomer Journal, and the data artistic in, achievements include Lifetime Award for, for Literature, um, Commonwealth Short Story finalist Derek Walcott, Literature, Literature Prize for the Sapote Soil. Sapote Soil was, is used as um, a text in secondary schools, walking used as a text in UTTs growing up in the Caribbean course, debut film Legends Revisited, selected for the Can Pan African Film Festival in 2016 and was an official selection of the Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival in 2016, nominated for the People's Choice. Yeah, that's Joanne Haynes. And of course, um, rounding out the panel is Ayaguro Ome, um, the founder of the Sinhu Center, which, is, is, which has, was established, sorry, in 2016. It is dedicated to providing studies and publications regarding issues pertinent to African and Caribbean culture, as well as facilitating charitable works in Trinidad and Tobago. Is the former chairman of the Trinidad and Tobago National Committee on Reparations. Uh, he was educated in primary schools in North and South Trinidad. He attended Trinity College, Port of Spain, and he won a scholarship to the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, in 1967, and read English literature, history, and social sociology. Sorry. He's a foundation member of the National Joint Action Committee, NJAP, 
formed on the 26th of February, 1969 at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. He was an activist in Trinidad and Tobago, Black Power Revolution in 1970, led by Enja. He was imprisoned and charged for sedation during the 1970s state of emergency, and he graduated with honors in 1970, having sat his exams while in prison. After his release, he taught history and Spanish in the Arima Government Secondary School. He has been the president of three NJAC institutions, the National Action Cultural Committee, the Caribbean Institute of Race Relations, and the Caribbean Historical Society. He is a spiritual elder, having officiated at African Rites of Passage, as well as other functions at the NACC's Council of Elders. He's also an author of three books, The Story of Emancipation, I Am a Young King, and Light a Candle, Say a Prayer, Play a Drum Towards the Emancipation Day Ritual. He's a former columnist for the Trinidad and Tobago Guardian and remains a contributor of letters to the editor for the daily newspapers. He has also received the Shaconia Medal Silver for Distinguished Service in culture. And here we have it, our panelists for this convoy. Um, and listen, I, I, I think in the wisdom, they choose me to deal with this panel because they know I have a leaning towards casual now. And, and although we're saying it's, it's part of this, this, this um, whole distinguished level of academic discourse around shadow, we want to also make this a line, a discussion about people who have different views coming from different angles about this dreadness and the everyday um, applications, you know. Um, I, I want to start off by, by, by giving a quote from one of my favorite songs from Shadow, where he says, Nowadays, you enter a strange land. They call you an alien. You have to explain to immigration what is your intention. Columbus didn't have to do that. It just didn't make no sense. His authority was a cork hat and his passport. Violence. Was violence. <laughs> uh, if that is dreadness, I don't know what is, ladies and gentlemen. Very dread. Yeah. Um, and what, how we would, would like to start it is we would just go around for our opening statement from all of you in terms of maybe what you interpret the, the topic to mean. Um, what you interpret dreadness to mean, and then we'll take it from there. We, we, we're trying to exploit, we're trying to really, um, you know, have a look at it and, and then have a nice discussion. We real dread everybody is somebody. Yeah? And I, I, I will start um, with, with Joanne. Hi, everybody. Thanks for that great introduction, Omari. Very happy to be here, and I want to just give a big up to you we for doing this and, and raising the visibility of Shadow's work, you know. We have so many philosophers here in our, in our place and it's time for us to pay attention. Um, when I was invited to present at this symposium, my first thought, dreadness, my first thought was, um, has the word dreadness ever been used before Shadow named his 1976 album Dreadness? I don't know. Maybe Zeno and them could tell me that, but the brilliance of Shadow to me was that he was a kind of guerrilla artist, in my opinion. You're talking about casuality, and you couldn't you couldn't find somebody who had a more down to earth vibe about him. Um, Shadow would take these simple, relatable, everyday concepts and just slam it home. I, I, I just think of Shadow as a genius because you see that using that one word or that one phrase to slam home a punch and you take something simple and you, you, you dig up all inside it. Um, you know, we always talk about this Shakespeare quote, if music be the food of love, play on. But I hear in Shadow saying, music is a great equalizer. Everybody could dingole. To me, Shadow is about a Caribbean identity, a very, a very wide Caribbean identity in the sense that he never, he never tell you what to think about his work, about himself. He say what he had to say and he done with that. You take it or leave it, you interpret it how you want. And I find that that ability to take the simple and frame it into so many different ways, um, layer ideas on top of ideas, bring deep messages and philosophies in 
in simple, simple ways, um, misleading lines that just speak of everyday people. But when we dig inside it, it's so deep, it's so wide, it's so profound. Um, I say that as a kind of guerrilla strategy, and that is how I interpret shadow dreadness. Yeah, I, I, like, I like the idea of that guerrilla strategy. Um, that's, a, that's a nice point to, to, to deal with as we get into it. Um, Zeno Constance. I would oh, like to bring point. Yes, man. <laughs> when you think of dreadness and shadow, well, the word dread became popular in the mid 1970s um, for two reasons. I mean, when we were on campus in the mid 70s, the, the search for Rastafari began. I mean, they, they were always on the periphery of our world. Um, but after the, 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 the Hidi um, demonstration of the streets and so on, and the whole north in the hills, there's a, there's a kind of searching for Rastafari. And we all turned to the book called Dread, in which that word came at us as I you know, the dread, the, not only fear inspiring, but as with the different. And, and we use the word dread, meaning it could be a hostile thing against us. I could, I could remember Daga saying, um, this theater in Brazil is a kind of dread kind of thing, you know, meaning it's something that you have to fight, something you want to fight you. And I suppose in that context, Shadow would have begun to call himself Dread. I'm not sure, obviously, <laughs> which um, are those two things I talk about there, the, the, the Rastafarian Dread or the use of Dread that came out of the, the movement right? and the situation at the times he took. And as John said, I think in 76 or maybe 77, that, that he first used the word Dread. Um, to, um, to, to describe himself. And I suppose we have to be doing it, as I think Omari did explain once, in a kind of anti hero kind of way, like how Rudolf, oh God, Rudolf now. They were a clerk, he used to call himself an Obia man. Meaning, listen, all they say Obia bad. But as an Obia man, that means that I'm going to give you the best out of that. And that is your business, how you, how you take it. And he might have been saying, I dread. It in the context, not simply of the Rastafarian, who are, are the outlaw, um, you know, from the society, at least from the society elite, but from the way the society saw that whole movement of, of the 70s, the whole, the whole black movement. I will find out later on one of these days, but I think somewhere there, we get the dread man. Yeah, yeah, give, yeah, give me plenty to deal with there, you know, and, and, and not knowing, you, you, we end up knowing plenty, right? So, yeah, give me plenty <laughs> to deal with. <laughs> um, at this point in time, I want to um, bring Ayagoro in, into the um, conversation in terms of um, what you would uh, interpret that dreadness or what you see it as in terms of Shadow's perspective, or maybe even yours, and as it relates to Shadow and music and maybe even the time. Maybe you're muted, you know. Um, okay. Yes, th thank you very much, Omari, for the kind introduction that you gave. And I want to thank you for having invited me to this convoi. I, I recently wrote something about convoi. Convoi was a term that was used by the French Creole speaking Africans for the secret societies. Um, it is they who led the struggle in 1805 when they wanted to poison all the white people in Trinidad and Tobago. And they had several names for their convoi. I can't go through all the names now. But th those convoi were really mutual aid societies that later converted into radical groups to deal with the oppression that they were suffering. Now, <clears throat> When it comes to the question of dread or dreadness, I, I first learned the term dread when I was on campus on 60, in 67. Um, Gordon Rowley was doing a lot of commentary on the question of what was happening in Jamaica at the time. And we applied the concept of dread 
to the Jamaican Rastafarians. Rastafarianism hadn't fully developed here in Trinidad at that time. And we used to hear the term in music like um, Prince Buster's song, Judge Dread. I, I don't know how many of the younger persons here, possibly with the exception of, of Zeno, who remember that song from, from Prince Buster. And part of it said, um, order, now my court is in session, would you please stand? First, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Judge Hundred Years. Some people call me Judge Dread. Now I have come here to whoop you, to try all you rude boys for shooting black people. In my court, only me talk because I'm vexed and I am the rude boy today. And he starts to run down the names, well, fictional names of some of the rude boys. Um, we didn't have bajans in Jamaica, we had rude boys. Um, over here is bandits or whatever names we, 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 we tend to use. The thing about it is that um, dreadness was associated with those young black men in Jamaica. So it got transformed when, was, when it was used, the term was used in Trinidad to represent the question of, you know, things, things very bad, things dread. Strangely enough, the word dread now is associated with Padna. So you talk about Majed. And it is strange coming down the lines from a term that was, because people did fear the rude boys, the term came right down now to a, a, a more comforting term when you speak about your dread. So that is how I understand dread, but Shadow himself became dread because of how he approached Calypso. And I don't think he used the term dread himself until sometime in 1979 when he had that song that he was a dread wizard, poverty dread, misery dread. And I was born in them, so I must be dread. Dread, dread, dread. I am the wizard who was born dread. So I, I just want to mention those few things as we, as we have started off. That is great. That, and that's, that's a good place to start too. Um, I don't know if he had it in a song before that, but he, he, he had an album, which I think was done in 76. You know, if I'm wrong, you could tell me. Which was the, which is where we got the name of this thing from dreadness, but I don't think there was a a song on that song. that referenced dreadness. Um, but the album itself was called dreadness. Robin Foster, mm -hmm. yeah, this is your chance to come in and, and give me something, man. The only way do something. Okay, well, right. Well, this whole idea of dreadness. Um, oh, I interpreted it right. All right, this morning. First thing I, um, I tell my wife this morning, I say, listen, I have this thing to do about shadow today. You know, what's the first thing you think about when, when, when I say shadow? She said, look, I'm still sleeping. Don't ask me nothing. So I say, no, now is the best time. I say, now that you're yeah, thinking too much, just give me something out of your guts. You know, she say, see me, see me. I say, right, that is, that is it, right? Because when you think of it, that whole idea, right? A lot of things a lot of people don't know is Shadow never called himself the mighty Shadow. It was just the Shadow. And he would, his, um, his people, because a tradition gave him, say, the mighty, the mighty Shadow, right? But it was, and I remember falling in love with him since in the, well, since Baseman in my early teens, right? And um, after Baseman, I remember that day, Carnival Day, everybody just standing up and jumping on one spot to the bass man. It was the first time I'd ever hear, like, we only hear bass man on the street. He came first and second. He came first with bass man and second with I come out to play, right? That year, too, um, he... I think they rob him for the crown, right? Because they give they give it a sparrow. Because in those days, a lot of people used to believe that if you're not singing some kind of high philosophical something, that that it was not a way called a savanna song, you know. And 
you know, I remember people telling me, you know, um, Shallow couldn't win. He was singing shit, you know. And I said, like, um, because Baseman and I Come Out to Play wasn't some philosophical thing, right? But if you look at um, the imagery and the lyrics and everything, Shallow clearly, I would say, won, right? But what he did win was, for the first time in, the, in, in those years, 74, 75, 76, he was, I would say, the first Calypso person who took, um, who became popular for the entire year, right? I remember he started to release songs. Uh, man could change my destination. He released those things mid-year. And they were big hits, monster hits. And um, he, it was the first time I remember we, they had a lot of foreign shows. A lot of foreign superstars would come to perform. You know, mainly I think the Savannah was the main place in those days, right? Spectacular and all that. They started they having big shows. And they would have Shadow as the guest artist. And Shadow would flatten the place. I mean, like, <laughs> it was hard for the foreign person to come and, and keep up with that, you know. Um, so I think he was very instrumental in popularizing in what David Radad has called the middle of the year road march. He was the, he was the king of that, right? And um, so, yeah, um, but what, I, what intrigued me about him and why he became my favorite artist from since those days is the whole idea of that whole dreadness, the shadow. He, in those days, I realized he didn't, he didn't like too much light on him. He liked to be in dark. He, he wanted to be a shadow, right? And um, he would, that, his storytelling and, and, and about the dreadness, but what a lot of people don't understand, he was one of the most humorous, Calypsonians to ever sing. He was spoiler level, right? Oh. Um, and a lot of things is if you would, like what I did, if you would listen to our entire Shadow album, the songs that don't play on the radio, right, was some of the, the funniest songs, you know? Um, and in Shadow's entire album would be, would, would be good, you know? And... Um, Hey, and a funny thing too, we had the same birthday. We were both born on the 4th of October. And <laughs> um, yeah, I got to, and after, well, after I opened the studio and thing and a, a record, like a couple jingles with him and that kind of thing. And we, we got to know each other, you know, he would call me every time and say, happy birthday, boy. Or he would come and bring a bottle, um, a Johnny Walker Black, drink some and leave half the bottle and say, right, you drink the rest and go, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we, we became friends and he told me a lot of things, you know, which, you know, um, we will get into as we, as we yeah. go down. <laughs> You know, he, was a, he was a very funny guy, trust me. <laughs> try to extract some of those things, at least the things we could talk about in, in open forum, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, so as we continue to, to consider um, this, this energy of dreadness, and, and I, I had to do some, um, because you know, sometimes when you're close with a, with a subject, because I, uh, Shadow is, is, is part of my holy trinity, a, a Calypsonian, right? Mm -hmm. And and so so sometimes you just had to kind of step back and look. So when they say dreadness, I started to look at it again and perhaps what I could think of that I could pull from that, you know. And for me, is a kind of um, I think it was a positionality of listen, this is me, and you had to deal with it, right? I you know what I mean? I come to 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 try to fit into all your things. This is me, and you have to deal with it. And I, and I think sometimes perhaps when, when people um, apply that kind of uh, attitude in certain spaces, it could make every everybody uncomfortable, including the self. Everybody could end up, boy, you know, man, funny boy, you know, you know. And that was one of the major things that people used to say about Shadow. Boy, he, he funny, you know, his thing, you know, because any minute if you talk to him, you just stand up on the wrong side of Shadow, you could get a buff, eh? And you know why and that kind of thing. But I, I feel that that kind of fed in to the idea of 
of disrupting the space now, you know. Um, so, Joanne, I, I know for, 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 for you did a, a kind of look, a close look at the baseman, you know, um, and, and you, had, you had some thoughts on it. So I don't know if you want to, to give us a, a little bit of, of that at this moment. Um, sure, man. Yeah, sure. Um, I was eight years old when this man came out and uh, that pumpkin pump pump just stuck inside me. I was pumpkin all over the house, that carnival. Um, I got slapped from my mother for pumpkin down the step um, Ash Wednesday because they're not supposed to sing much more dance calypso then. But I couldn't get a tune out of my head. But at eight years old, I hear a wail and shadow voice that tell me that Beastman wasn't just a happy song. Um, when he said, I don't know how this thing get inside me. It have these lines that is reach inside to a, a place of connection and emotion. And I, I still feel today that in my humble opinion, that shadow is underestimated. I still feel that today. I see I see Shadow as a philosopher, but in such a Caribbean way that we maybe take it for granted or, you know, because we colonialize and we formalize our education system and we feel when you're talking this serious talk, you have to talk a certain way and you have to move a certain way and you have to look a certain way and Shadow was outside of that and it reminded me of how the seal pan just come about. This is how Caribbean people learn. We kind of have a freedom. We expansive, we creative, we dynamic, and we don't really follow them rules because those rules were not made for our our personality. So I would say I would put Shadow on the same level in terms of philosophy as Rudder. It's just he bring it different. So I say with Baseman, later on, I always I'm still today fascinated with that song. Um what I see is a simple idea of wanting to escape one's life, which we all feel at different points in our life. I was planning to forget Calypso and go and plant peace in Tobago. Everybody at some point feels the yearning to run from the responsibility, the work, the doing, and just retire, escape, forget it all, let it go. And yet, he takes this simple idea and complicated it with the baseman because the baseman would not let him go. So the simple idea of escaping one's life, but he then unravel it and mix it up and, and stir up all sorts of things inside it. Um, the baseman represents for me destiny. You might have one desire, but your destiny will, de will decide for you. The baseman represents the master destiny ruling you not what you really want to do he can't get rid of this thing inside his head um the destiny the baseman represents conscience going to dr leon to get this thing out of his head mm -hmm. and dr leon says his imagination but i know i hear in a baseman so that 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 idea of conscience who you're listening to the noise of the world or the noise of yourself the noise inside you um, what is imagination? What is reality? If you listen to them, you go go mad. In that one simple line, Dr. Leon says my imagination, but I know I hear in a basement. To me, that is philosophy about following your own truth. What is your self-truth? What guides you? And who you listening to at the end of the day? And these simple rhyming lines are what I call it loaded lines because I find this artist with the ability to create so much thought um, sends such a powerful message beyond what you're actually just hearing if it was to really dig up inside it it is it is a whole big message you know um, and at the end of the day he never tell us how he resolve the noise in his head versus getting rid of it, not being able to get, he never tell us, we just know he didn't go and plant peace in Tobago. And that to me is classic shadow as well, that you, you bring a journey to the people. You're not bringing a how to do this, how to fix that, what wrong with the system. You're not doing that. You're bringing a experience. You're bringing a connecting factor, you know? Um, and I see the baseman as a, 
Azarel philosophy on the question of escapism, um, a commentary rather on the complications of ex escapism. Um, and in the final analysis, I was planning to forget Calypso and go and plant peace in Tobago. So for him, planting peace was escape. For the farmer, planting peace is not escape. That's the same hard work he's trying to run from. That's the same frustration, the same doing that Shadow wants to retire from. So for me, that big question in Baseman is, you want to escape? Where you go? At the end of the day, something inside you will keep you doing, keep you moving, keep you pumping. And it's either you, you, you listen to the people out there and they say, as, 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 as Robin said earlier, you're singing shit or you're doing your thing. What is your self-truth? Um, yeah, that's, that's me, that's my best man. Yeah, and you know what ironic about that, right? I was planning to forget Calypso and go and plant peas in Tobago. I, I don't think there are two more famous lines in Calypso than that. I think those are the two most famous lines in Calypso ever. And yeah. how I interpret that is, what is ironic about that is that he was just like, uh, before that, he was just like a regular little tent Calypsonian. You hear about him, the shadow, and his name the skull. But from that baseman made him a superstar. In other words, so, you know, Elena was, if, if, if the baseman didn't happen, I might have really had to go and plant peas in Tobago, you know, but the, and that is the song ironically that made him. Yeah, yeah. That the song, the song when he we were he kind of and 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 I mean look at it really is he's declaring a kind of frustration, eh? You know, yeah. the will in the voice, the will in the yeah. voice, yeah. Kind of frustration. Yeah. Um, but he's also admitting that he can't. All he frustrated, he frustrated. He, he have to listen to that drum beat. He have to come and do the work and have to make the music because that is what he come to do. So he's also kind of resigning himself right. to doing what he has to do too as well, you know? Um, and that, that loaded line, Dr. Leon said, is my imagination, but I know I hear in a basement. So it's like what you're saying, you're haunted, you're haunted, you know this thing inside, you just... And you can't give it up. And um, and I, I think that's a big artistic statement too. The angst of creating and, and the lows of creating that, that artists sometimes want to run from the craft and the, the isolation and loneliness that you feel. So um I, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, yeah. Go ahead. I see Ayagoro has his hand up. Um, I just want to uh, get some water, but I can hear we get some water. Yes, I, I was hear. I was just worried that. We, we could have been shifting slightly away from one of the essences of this convo, which is that the question of shadow and his music, shadow began to transform the music of Calypso and it started with bass man. Uh, he put the bass very strategically into the music. So much so that um, the, the very tenor of the music began to change. And I remember going up to Shadow's home in Mount Hope with the chief, late chief servant, Makandal Daga. And we were seeking to tell him, listener, Shadow, you've got to find a name for what you are doing. And he, he laughed at us. He said, what do you want me to call it? The Shadi Wadi? And to my surprise, I, I saw Shadi Wadi on something on, on YouTube recently about Shadow and his music. You see, a lot of people have not appreciated the nuances that are there in Calypso. Shadow was able to bring out one of the nuances, which was the bass line. And there's another thing that began to be looked at, which Omari began to touch on. Um, Shadow's stagecraft. Shadow was a persona in himself. And when he walked through the streets, you did have the feeling, look, that is a dread man coming down there. Good. So I, I would have liked us to look at those two aspects 
of Shadow in this convo. One, his musicianship, and two, his stagecraft, his persona. Well, well as we, we, we're hoping to touch on, on several things. So as we go along, we may, we may pull some of those ideas that, that you brought up there um, into the mix because they are indeed important aspects um, in dealing with, with the shadow and in this space, you know, um, there was, you know, there was a, um, there was a little, you know, I, I just follow you online religiously because every, every week or month or so we could look forward for some kind of series from you. And there was a, a, a series you did on the shadow where you kind of broke up um, his situation into a couple um, different stages. Um, I don't know if, if you could give them sad at him only give you everything because I know it's plenty, right? But <laughs> we, even how we approach it and how you saw it, kind of thing. Well, I don't dare give you everything. <laughs> um, let me say that I am confident that Shadow wasn't going to plant no peas into me. <laughs> I think that that is a metaphor for I'm going to try again because yeah. it comes from. From, from the threat, troubling 72, will be a man. And we're just on, on that phase, right? And what this phase created, it gave birth to Farrell, an interesting character because Farrell controls Shadow. Mm -hmm. Now, it does not control Winston Bailey, but it oh. controls Shadow, right? And Shadow has, a, 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 hmm, I think, over, over seven calypsos in which Farrell is there, right, confusing him. So I think he created a, a character in his mind and the character came to life and that character controlled him because it controlled the, the shadow, as I say, not Winston, because there's a, a big difference between the Calypsonian and the, and, the, um, and the person who makes that Calypso. So that's what I think. So Shadow was coming down that line and I think that um, the frustration of the threat when he didn't get um, the kind of the kind of success he wanted, right? In, in fact, I wrote up a scene about it in 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 um, in, in uh, the Robert seventies, um, and then he did the Submarine seventy two, which it has an interesting thing in Submarine seventy two because he does say that listen to the bass, his music in the place. And that would be Bacchanal for the carnival. And I say that because in a few years' time, the base will become, to me, and I suspect to people out there, the central motif that will create the soca. You want, that, you want the soca that, that, no, I don't want to say to create the soca of my show of shadow, we create the soca that shadow had. Because ultimately, that base will be there. And Shadow does an interesting thing when he comes to do Soka Boat. Um, there's a bass line, in, a bass run in Soka Boat, a guitar run behind that never stops. It is not mm -hmm. there in the, in the, in the um, new version, but in the first version, it is there. It never stops. I think that, that, that bass is a message to say, you know, that is my bass. So what you're talking about is your Soka. So it's just in kind of way that Shadow will create a character who will control him. And that's because that is the, how, the, how the author creates and the character grows in the life and becomes so big that uh, he tells him where to go. So far, lead him all over the place. But I think Shadow was just going to have at his fourth phase of trying to, uh, to get past the establishment into the Calypso. And, um, and maybe he didn't realize, I don't know if he ever realized that the way he crafts things made him successful to us, but not to the judges. Mm. And let me just finish with this point, that that is exactly why Shadow did not get past 1994 with Poverty Yourself. Because if you take pen and paper and have to mark down next to that lyrics and so on, the sacrifice of lyrics for, for imagery, you couldn't understand on a piece of paper. And that I think um, will of course will of course have a serious trouble. So if I answer a good question on music, musical ability, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. and 
I'm really glad Zeno and Ayogoro bring up that, right? Because we have a couple things to deal with here. Before Baseman, right? Now, it could be because Baseman was about base. It could have happened. But before that, Calypso just had the walking bass line, you know? Boom, boom, boom. Which followed the chords. What Pelham Goddard would call chord symbols, right? But because the song was about it was the first song with a bass line right and um and and that that was that was the first phase and then the second phase that what zeno uh, mentioned that soca boat it was the that was the beginning beginning of the heavier bass which um which became into like a, the rap so and the the the, 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 the various fusions into other things, uh, hip hop and dub and all them things, right? That heavy bass. Um, and another interesting thing, that that soca boat bass line was basically the Tobago reel and jig fiddle put on the bass. You know, and he played on the bass. Dun, 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 dun. Dung, 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 right? Um, yeah, yeah, so it was that <laughs> yeah, point, yeah, that same point, yeah. Right, and and also, um, what he, what Zeno was pointing out there about um, not for the judges, uh, but for us, right? Shadow had a certain poetic license that nobody else had, right? Anybody else sing, so the cat see a chicky chong, he dash for the chicky chong, but the poor little chicky chong flew away like a chicky chong. They would have got pelt off the stage. Right, Shadow is the only person who could have say that, you know, who had the poetic license to say that, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, serious and, man. And and there there is there is a uh, a thing that that you have to look at when you when you're speaking to Shadow and and his lyrics as well, right? Um, which is economy of language. <clears throat> and when you when you when you look at who could string an idea and not just an idea sometimes a whole story in two three lines you know right. you have a couple of people good at that right um mm -hmm. but shadow is definitely right. a master of simplicity um drawing you in you know if you start off a song with a little boy named Corduroy. <laughs> well, I want to, I had to hear the rest now. <laughs> oh, Corduroy. Why the name Corduroy? Where does Corduroy come out? What Corduroy about? You want to hear the rest from Shadow. If it was somebody else, you might have said they off the stage. <laughs> and, 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 but the reason for that, as well, again, is, is because of Shadow and, and, and Ayagoro alluded to his stage presence and his performance. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a big part of the thing too. That that could have possibly, I don't know, would have would have given some other license. You, you talk about Robin, because mm -hmm. we know when this when this man come on the stage, we're not expecting the usual. You know, I remember um, if you see Shadow move, it's like a reward. So so whereas a, a Calypso Nengo come on stage, and he dancing all the time. If Shadow open the jacket so and there two ways, the whole crowd gone mad. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> because it, it is now he created this idea that hey, look, Shadow <laughs> and if Shadow dance anything bad, because Shadow don't dance, it's bad. So so it it is it, it is that idea of of the persona again, perhaps powered by Farrell's, you know, um mm -hmm. that is on stage that now gives you this giant this 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 almost um he, he almost constantly is making in, in in terms of um what he's given to us and so 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 i always tell people if you want to hear some of the best opening lines you understand spreading joy in la romaine i mean <laughs> any bumps up hard face jane yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, it is over from there you have to listen and so 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 there, there is, but 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 inside of that, right? Inside of that, and uh, what I want us to, to, to look at perhaps is how that gives us 
an entry point to deal with we too because shadow almost tackle everything you know when you you as a person who didn't ask themselves at some point in life but what wrong with me boy mm-hmm. what wrong why i'm what wrong with me what, yeah you know and 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 it, he always gives you a way to work things out kind of you know what i mean you're looking for horn you know how much people that real for you in love with this thing you watching this boy and you watching it look at him yeah you will have nothing you got married you were married and so 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 from the very um almost mundane to the larger things like columbus like you know what i mean so he so he is treating with life like a philosopher like john indicated that he's our philosopher and gives us these these gems to hold on to and to to, to work through um a lot of things um so 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 getting back to to to, to that performance i go i don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit um in particularly i i i was born in in 72 right so i'm not sure um perhaps how uh any of the revolution in pack and shadow or what happened or, or, or if if we took anything with him or or if it you know if there's any kind of intersection there that you might be able to shed some light on well what what i can say is that he, he always remained very close to us and um we close to him in fact he appeared on the very earliest calypso concerts that were ever held in this country the series called the black traditions in art yeah. um he was present there and um, we would interact a lot with him. But when you talk about the Posana and the stagecraft, every time I hear poverty is hell, I hear Rapso. Um, yeah. I, I, I could be wrong about it, but I hear Rapso. And when you look at any video of Shadow singing poverty is hell, you will see him actually crying. And there is a moment on stage when tears come to his eyes because he is describing the situation of the average Kechas man. And some of the situations, we may find them very humorous now. I always like the part about the cockroach that went into the condensed milk. That, that is a very rare situation, you know, because condensed milk at times was a luxury item in homes, even in the home that I came from, and I came from a family of teachers. You could not waste condensed milk. And if you let a situation develop where cockroach get in the condensed milk, you will get so much and so much and so much of licks. All scrape. of these, sit sorry? You had to scrape out the, the, the condensed milk thing. You had to, you um, don't, be so, don't, don't be so graphic now. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> right that is and you throw the coffee in and shake it up right? <laughs> yes yes and it's it very hot still you know but you, yeah. you're spinning it around to get a last out of Nasty. it those are very graphic statements about life here and that is one of the powers that that shadow had the rapso slash calypso is about life same thing with the with the song Dingole. I remember there, there was a very senior classical performer from Guyana. I can't remember her name now. And she says that was her all-time favorite piece of music. And she's trained in, in the European classical tradition. Eh? She said that was her all-time favorite piece of music. Because essentially he's saying that music is for everybody yeah. so when we when we speak about spiral and it is so good that we're using this occasion sorry, shadow this occasion to remember him we have to remember all these different aspects of life that he touched on and i only wish that this could have been done years ago even before you honored him with the honorary doctorate in fact when i heard he was getting the doctorate I was a bit upset because I knew he was in hospital and that he was very ill. 
the very last time I saw Shadow was walking in the corridors of the hospital. I said, how are you going? He said, well, I'm up here. So we, we need to take those other aspects of, sh of Shadow, the persona on stage, his musicianship, and we have to look at the fact that from a philosophical point of view, he touched on almost everything in the life of Caribbean and Trinidadian and Tobagonian people. Indeed. Um, we are at now maybe 10 to the hour. So if if um, anyone wants to ask questions, they could probably put it um, in the chat. I think the administrator would probably get it to us. Um, while, while we're waiting on that, um, Robin, mm -hmm. have, you, have you ever recorded Shadow outside of a jingle or anything like that? Um, um, only live. Only live. Because mm -hmm. one of the things with Shadow, I, I like to tell people Shadow was very, I, I want to bring to people how loyal he was to this zombie this, this vibe, um, Shadow would, would be in the studio and he would, you, he, you would, he would tell you, well, listen, you, you mix the song for me, right? Mm. And this is with the intention of the engineer coming back and doing our next mix, right? Mm. But if Shadow liked that first mix, that is it there, no. He don't want to hear you have going back and fix that, right? He mm. have a belief that the first thing you do that song, right? That is it. Well, you see, you bring up that. Um, I could tell you, right? Every year, for, for a few years, Shadow, when he finished his, uh, before he mastered or anything, he would come to the studio and we would go in the room and he would play it and he would say, what you think, right? <laughs> I remember one time listening there that tell him, I say, I say, boy, Shadow, this it, it, it has something like it finished, you know. He said, No, that's how it's supposed to song, you know. What I mean, so I say, I say, Shadow, <laughs> you ask me my opinion, right? I gave me opinion, right? You know, what I mean, and then he go say, He go say, like, he go say, Wait, 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 Robin, how much hit you had? Let me hear, let me hear. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, Shadow, I say, I say, you see, I can remember hit the half. I say, don't bring back no record in here again for better here, eh? right? And then, but the yeah, funny just, thing is, whatever I tell him, though, whatever I tell him, he would argue with me down to the end and say, no, that's what about the song. It's about the. Da, 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 da. But he would always go back and fix it. Eh? He would yeah. always so, go I'm back. Gonna, yeah, Shadow. Yeah. Yeah. He would always sound better when he come back. A phenomenal. No, you know, we have seven minutes. So I want to give everybody a chance just to get in um, a final say in this discussion. Um, so we could end how we start with the ladies, with the lady first, so John. Yeah, man. I um I just love Shadow. And my love is that I I I find that Shadow sees we and is we, plays to we, sings for we. This ability to teach without teaching, um, to share without being pedantic, to include, connect, as I said, bring big, big philosophies and ideas and simple lyrics that everybody could relate to and ensure that he making us move while he's doing it. To me, that's the Caribbean way. Um, a very decolonized kind of approach to sharing and education and learning and so on. And, um, I just think, you know, the man was a real genius, a wordsmith, a teacher, a philosopher, and, um, and making us pump up to now. This man is cast down when you hear that, more than almost 50 years later. So, yeah, that's, that's my, my, my bit. Do you know? Yeah, um, well, two little things. One is that um, it's amazing, but it shouldn't be amazing. But every shadow calypso have a melody or a beat or a rhythm that make you either dance or nod your head. Unlike yeah. so many calypsos nowadays that have been finals and things, I wouldn't pursue that. But I just want to make a one little thing <laughs> here for 30 seconds, and that is tell a story about how Omari and Shalom set me up a day 
because I ask them for shadow number and tell them I want to write a book on shadow. And Shalon give me the number, call him and be good. And I call Shadow. And I introduce myself and say, I want to write this book. And the man give me one book <laughs> and tell me, people always feel they know about me better than, than me. I go write my book when I'm ready. I just quietly bored <laughs> in, in the face of the master and keep it till quiet. My only time I ever talk to Shadow, get close enough to him. And yeah, it was a nice experience, even though I get a book. But then I, I get a book from a master. <laughs> That is a good book to get. I go yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're, you're, you're well set, my but it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, a comment that is a bit contrary to what, what we have um, been discussing. I am perpetually concerned about how we take care of our aging artists, how we take care of them while living and even in the stage when they are in their decline. I am very worried about it. I know a number of Calypsonians who are not well. I have pleaded with Tuco to please establish that convalescent home for the, the artists. And I am hoping that we don't have to go through this kind of convoy again after the man dies because he, he died at the public hospital, eh? Mount, Hope, Mount Hope Hospital there. And even when Yui was contemplating to offer him the, the honorary doctorate, I was aware that he was in decline. I think we need to put a stop to those situations. I can't call the names of the Calypsonians who are not well right now, but we need to pay some attention to that. Yeah, that has to be noted. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, boy, I let me, let me end on a happy note with me, right? I one of the funniest things Shadow ever said to me, what I always remember him telling me, right, is, you know, once he came to me and he said, um, he said, this is the last days, boy. This is the last days. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, yeah, see what's going on? He said, they send AIDS to kill man, mealybug to kill tree. And they send this little boy with this drum machine to kill music. <laughs> 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 They said, I'm small, I know musicians, it's the music. He said, no, I get yeah. big this size. They're telling me, no, that what kind of music with the men making it is not musicians. So I say, if the men is not musicians, then it cannot be music. So I said, well, wait, is that? He said, well, I just call it dating. <laughs> so we have a, we have a I really miss him bad, boy. <laughs> from Mr. Shaq. He says, I think Shadow used his music in his artistic persona of the Shadow as a coping mechanism of sorts to address, navigate, and also, in a sense, conquer the things that mortal Winston Bailey self was fearful of or apprehensive about. Things like occult, infidelity, advantage, inequality, injustice, etc., etc. So, in a general sense, his whole embracing of dreadness was almost like a suit of armor uh, to run in and tackle these things. What are the panel's view on this perspective? Yes, I would say I I appreciate that because um he had this he had a whole thing about about horning like be, not, beside you're looking for horn tan tan Janet you know he, you know he would go and the man would come home and 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 all them kind of dread songs right but they would have such funny lines in them <laughs> it was really an armor as he said you know. To, to treat with those things. Anybody else have a perspective on that? I am. I am. I am very concerned that, from the philosophical point of view, we didn't adequately understand shadow. I think what Shark says is, is is quite true, and I think we need to apply that now to a lot of other Calypsonians who may have similar concerns and hurts, and how how they deal with them. Yeah, good perspective. Anybody else? I am also seeing in the chat um, the late Louis Regis shared a thought with me many years ago. Shadow is in the business of distilling folk wisdom. Um, and I think that is a, a, a good point at which to end. Shadow was in the business of distilling folk wisdom. Yeah, I want to thank Robin Foster, you know, Constance, I agree with me, 
and Joanne Haynes for joining us today. Um, your input was critical and important. It was a good rounding out to this section of the formalities of the, of the day. Um, in just about uh, a little later, what, what time is, are we starting? The dingole? Two dance. hours, two hours from six to seven. Yes, from six to seven, we have the dingole dance party. Don't worry, it's virtual, right? So, you need to put no mass and thing. We have three DJs Kabuki, John Gill, and Honey Colada, and they'll be playing some um, Shadows music. Um, because I think at the end of the day, all this set of talk, 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 my dagger shadow fix. He would have liked to deal with some music. So we want to end the day in a nice way with place where we could go and hit music, right? Um, I want to say thank you very much uh, to both the panelists and the people who, who logged in. Um, I want to say thanks to the University of the West Indies at St. Augustine, the technical staff, um, the Groundation Foundation team led by Dr. Burke, uh, the firm uh, unit, and everyone who made this day, these two days really possible. Um, and we would, I would like to invite you all to enjoy, uh, um, join us at six to have at this session. Thank you, folks. All right, cool. Thank you, everybody. It was a very, very inspiring day. See you at six.